this unbelievable quote that they said they wanted a black person to do this job. Apparently, I'm the wrong kind of black. What do you mean by that? What happened? Well, um, you know, soon into my work at the Anza College, uh, I was being accused of white speaking and white explaining and supporting white supremacy, um, all for the offensive act of attempting to, you know, set an agenda for my team meetings and um, to collaborate on um, identifying projects that we could work on together. Um, it was something that I never encountered in my lifelong trek of teaching, um, especially in diversity, equity, and inclusion spaces. And uh, from there, I had to unpack and uncover what, what they were meaning um, because I'm from the Central Valley. I was born in Stockton and uh, raised in Lodi, California. And um, my understanding of white supremacy always had to do with organizations like the KKK and, and neo-Nazi organizations. So to have someone um, call me a white supremacist uh, was something that I just never encountered in my life oh as my. a racialized Black woman. My goodness. I mean, this is like the, um, you know, this is the, the sort of the line that we hear all too often. Like what they said, Larry Elder was the black face of white supremacy. Now, even being black does not save you from being called a white supremacist with this sort of crazy leftist group that is so ideologically bent on injecting race and their beliefs into everything. I understand one of the complaints they had against you was you had at one point been critical of Patrice Cullors, one of the founders of BLM, who is all over the news for having allegedly done some sketchy things financially when it comes to that group. They were mad that you had that you deigned to criticize her? Um, actually, Megan, it was... Um, oh, it was Alicia author, Garza. It was Alicia, Alicia Garza. Garza. Yes. Um, uh, when I started my position in 2021 at Anza, uh, they were doing this program where the school, uh, the president's office, purchased hundreds of of Alicia Garza's book, um, uh, The Purpose of Power. And so when I came in, uh, one of my first tenure track um, uh, assignments was to, in very short order, organize uh, students to and, and to facilitate a fireside chat with Alicia Garza. And uh, this would be on Zoom. And so I uh, very quickly, without knowing very much, um, organized and, and reached out to colleagues uh, who were kind enough to recommend students to me. I organized those students. Um, we collaborated on how the event would flow. Uh, the students were very excited that Alicia Garza was going to be uh, visiting and that they would get to, you know, directly ask her questions. Uh, we collaborated on those questions and ranked them. And we decided, you know, which student would ask theirs first. And uh, there was just a lot of excitement around it. At the 11th hour, I was informed by the Dean of Equity and Engagement that per Alicia Garza's contract, uh, she uh, would not ask any questions, uh, answer any questions uh, that her management team did not write and that she did not have the prescripted answers for. And this was quite surprising. Wow. And I had to take this back to the students. And uh, we were directed, we were given a list of questions and we were directed to use those. The students were very offended by this. Uh, they said, you know, we developed the, our questions and they're very different than what they're telling us. Um, and so I circled back to the Dean of Equity and Engagement and I said, hey, can I see the contract? You know, I. I'm familiar with speaker contracts and I've never heard anything like that. Um, and she refused to allow me to see it. It actually took a um, Freedom of Information Act request from the Foundation Against Intolerance and Racism, who assisted me with that, to discover uh, that A, the contract didn't say anything about questions that could or could be answered. And then B, that Alicia Garza was paid $10,000 to come on to Zoom um, and to perform questions that she had written with her management and that she had prescripted her answers for. So I'm so thankful oh. to uh, Foundation Against Intolerance and Racism for helping me to get to the truth of the matter, uh, you know, a little after it happened. Now, the disrespect that I was accused of by one of my um, tenure review members was that during the event, the compromise I came to with to the students, they said, we're not going to do this because it's fake and it's not real. I said, well, maybe we can ask the questions they're giving us. 
And then as follow-up questions, you can kind of, you know, work your questions in. And so they agreed to do that. And because that took place and the tenure review committee member was aware of that taking place, I was accused of disrespecting Alicia Garza. Now, during the event, uh, there was no sign of it unless you, you know, noticed when Alicia Garza, when, when it did get off script, when the students weren't asking the questions she was asked, she became visibly uncomfortable um, if you were looking from a back channel. But as the 400 plus participants that were there, they thought it was a wonderful event and they didn't see any disrespect. And they said, wow, it was great, you know, that she came here. Um, so I was accused of disrespect because of the back channel things that happened. And because I wanted to support the students in their freedom of speech and, and freedom of expression to engage an author in, a, in an authentic way. And they were very respectful about it. And so was I. That's unbelievable. It's not like she was sitting down for an audience at Fox News, you know, a focus group. This would, this would presumably be a, an audience of fans who are supporting her. And yet, no, she couldn't do it, but got the 10,000 bucks anyway. And the university running cover for her, as you point out, because they were misleading you about what was required and what wasn't by contract. Just to tell the audience again, this is De Anza College, located just outside of San Jose, where uh, Dr. Lee began working as uh, faculty director for the Office of Equity, Social Justice, and Multicultural Education in August of 2021. Two years later, they denied her tenure and ultimately let her go because she has some more heterodox views about some of these sacred issues, which presumably they knew about, Dr. Lee, when they hired you. you you're not you're not keeping your views a secret and you weren't prior to this job. Yes, that's exactly correct, uh, Megan. Uh, I went through a very rigorous um, interview process. I did teaching demonstrations, multiple panel interviews, um, and something that the panelists, not all of them, but some of them did mention uh, was that the office that I would be potentially serving in was a little too woke um, and that they had alienated um, some of the faculty from uh, the office uh, because they would, you know, call them out and uh, accuse them of being racist and and so forth. And and I assured the panel uh, that you know I did not identify as as woke. Um, and that what I do through my work is I try to create spaces where people, whether they're woke or not, or, you know, something else, uh, whoever they are, if they're in the space, in the learning community, that their perspective is able to be heard. Um, and that even amongst these diverse and like divergent um, viewpoints, we could identify points of commonality in order to best serve our students. Um, That's amazing. And so, and they selected me, you know, based on that very transparent, you know, understanding of my teaching approach and of how I approach things. Yeah, until they actually saw it and said, "Whoa, what are we doing?" And of course, if you get any complaints as an administrator in today's day and age, they they bow almost immediately. They bend and they break. That one of the uh, issues, as I understand it, was you were asking for definitions of terms like anti-racism. What do we really mean by that? And your refusal to use terms such as Latinx, and this was a new one to me, Philippinx, Latinx or Philippinx. You can pronounce it either way from what I understand. You also wanted to know why the B in black was being capitalized, but not the W in white. Now I see why they called you a white supremacist. This, this, <laughs> this will do it in today's day and age. Yes. And I, you know, uh, Megan, I was not an administrator. Um, my role is a faculty role. And so, and that's uh, why I took this role as a faculty director. And so I thought I would be afforded, you know, all of the academic freedom uh, protections and freedom of speech and expression, um, you know, protections that a tenure track faculty member would be afforded. Uh, what I found was that my tenure review process was actually obstructed and subverted um, by uh, ideological extremists. And they were very open about it um, and very biased against me because they did not want me, you know, um, creating these spaces. Uh, I did over 60 hours of needs assessment conversations when I first started. And a constant theme was people identifying that, you know, this the space here isn't one where we really talk about differences of opinion. You know, there's kind of just one view that that folks push. And I didn't give much credence to it, but I heard it more and more. And then as I started to experience it, I knew why I was getting those warnings initially. Um, and it's really unfortunate, you know, the things that have happened around it. 
Um, in terms of those, um, uh, some people are calling them gender neutral terms. I call them gender oppressive terms. Um, and why I say that, Megan, is because uh, those words like Latinx or Philippinx or, you know, however folks want to pronounce it, uh, they're inventions of the ivory tower. Uh, I worked for 10 years in uh, East Los Angeles public middle schools. Not once did any student or community member in the working class communities that I serve ever use those terms to describe themselves. Sherry from Omaha, Nebraska, has this to say about Genucel, quote, I have sensitive skin and I am careful about all products. Then my husband bought me Genucel's immediate effects product and the Genucel Deep Firming Serum. Felt it working immediately. Eyes look amazing, face feels smooth, and it diminished the appearance of wrinkles. So impressed. And thanks to Genucel and my husband, I take Genucel everywhere, end quote. And it's not just Sherry. Genucel has sold over 1 million products to women and men across this great country. Say goodbye to fine lines and wrinkles and even those annoying under-eye bags and puffiness from years of endless Zoom calls and the like. Look 5, 10, even 15 years younger, just in time for the warmer weather. Best of all, guaranteed results in as little as 12 hours or your money back. Go to genucel.com to see for yourself with 70% off their most popular package, all their best stuff, including the classic under-eye bags and puffiness treatment, free shipping, and luxury beauty box containing two free gifts with every subscription right now. Go to genucel.com slash mk60, g-e-n-u-c-e-l dot com slash mk60. Hey, thanks so much for watching. If you like what you just saw, hit the subscribe button for more clips and full episodes.